like to thank everyone for joining us at the uh, RCA conference uh, held over Zoom. It's been a very wonderful day so far, um, dealing with uh, the same sugi, the beginning of Kedushin, from a number of different perspectives. And our fourth and final speaker for today is Rev. Michael Rosenzweig, who is uh, known to all of us um, as a very prominent Rosh Yeshiva at, at Reitz, as the head of the Kolel Elyon there as well and uh, from a family that is, um, that in its blood um, is, is the Rabbinical Council of America. Um, we extend our condolences, Rabbi Rosenzweig, to you again on the passing of your father, Rabbi Dr. Bernard Rosenzweig, who was a president of Yeshiva, of, I'm sorry, president of, um, of the RCA, and um, who really uh, lived for it. He was, became a very dear friend to many of many different generations. And uh, we've dedicated this day of learning Le'ilui Nishmaso, as well as Le'ilui Nishmas, Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld as well, both of them Zichonam Livracha. Rabbi Rosenzweig. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the truth is when Rabbi Dratch, uh, actually my, my father's picture is actually over my shoulder. Um, so everybody can see my, my father as he uh, appeared, you know, not, uh, recently so much, but uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, when Rabbi Dratch uh, initially approached me to give the uh, shir, um, I was certainly happy to uh, uh, to consent to that. Um, but I was unaware, or maybe I just forgot, uh, no, I think actually it was before my father's patira, I think, um, I was unaware that this was going to be um, a session, Le'ilu um, Nishmas, some of the um, really special Rabbanim who you know, really, uh, as Rabbi Dratch just said, like lived and breathed and um, really put their imprimatur on the Rabbinical Council of America as an organization. So um, I actually wasn't aware um, of the uh, dedication of the shir until, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, but it's uh, an added um, schus for me to participate. Um, and, you know, since I have unlimited time, I shouldn't be too worried. Um, so let me just say a couple of words uh, about um, <laughs> these two remarkable Rabbanim, but I'll try to speak more broadly so I won't get too emotional um, and too personal. But um, I think, you know, this uh, particular session um, I see is also billed as kind of a Dera Halimud session, um, focusing on Torah's brisk, or at least the kind of broader methodology of uh, brisk, which I'll speak about very briefly. Um, and the two uh, Rabbanim, who we are, uh, you know, uh, remembering, um, you know, with a combination of uh, sadness because of their irrevocable loss, but also tremendous appreciation for the contributions that they have made, um, were two Talmidim Nemanim, two tremendously loyal um, students um, of the Rav, who really represented, in my opinion, together with um, their other Chaverim, I don't mean them to be exclusive, but that whole special group um, of Rabbanim, um, the kind of best um, of a generation of unsung rabbinic heroes, as I see it, um, that defied reality in terms of the, um, uh, you know, predictions, um, the prognostications, I guess, of um, the viability of a maximalist uh, Torah life um, in America and in the modern world, frankly. Um, again, we think that we have problems, and we do, significant ones. But uh, we should always keep uh, in mind and in perspective that the, um, the Rabbanim who preceded us, you know, by a generation or two generations, in this case, um, faced much bleaker circumstances than, than we do from every point of view. Um, and they were very uh, remarkable, principled people who, you know, were convinced that uh, they had no choice, you know, but to, uh, dive, you know, dive right in and try to elevate the community rather than to concede, you know, standards. And I think that they were uh, an unsung hero rabbinic um, generation for that reason. They um, changed the landscape and the trajectory uh, of Jewish life, not only in America, but I think in some respects in Eretz Yisrael as well, because of their deep commitment and conviction, their principled posture, their personal integrity, 
um, their maximalist commitment and their prodigious talent um, as Tamri Chachamim and also as very wise um, leaders, Manhigim, who understood the realities um, of you know, modern life um, and who knew exactly um, how to navigate the challenge of um, being relevant, um, being effective, and at the same time, um, you know, standing, you know, in the tradition of Masora uh, and being principled. And that is an extraordinarily difficult thing, as we all know, to accomplish. And they did this, you know, year after year. And especially as loyal and dedicated Talmidim of the Rav. Um, this was a group of Rabbanim. And, you know, again, foremost among them, but not only, you know, Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld, who was such a close friend of my father and who I had a tremendous regard for and affection for, um, you know, all the years. Our families are very tied. And of course, my father, uh, Rani Kaparis Mishkavo, um, who was really, you know, in the forefront of all of this. Um, these two Rabbanim and their, you know, special uh, group, cadre, recognized the special schus and opportunity that they had, and cherished the relationship with uh, a great man. They valued uh, immensely his guidance and his direction. They weren't worried about, you know, losing power or not being sufficiently um, independent. Uh, they knew that this rare uh, member, as he the Rav, used to speak himself, the Rav, of the club of Chachmi HaMesorah, wanted to encourage them to maximize their talents. But at the same time, um, they understood that there was a hierarchy and they needed his guidance. They were elevated and enriched by his guidance. They knew the rare secret of being a loyal Talmud while at the same time cultivating and contributing their own nofech uh, mishalahem, which was considerable, each one in his own you know, special way um, in order to pass you know, um, the Masora to the next generation where they made their contributions, you know, as well. They took what they got uh, from their Rabbanim and their, you know, Rabbeim, and especially from the Rav. Um, and, you know, in the process, they became great people themselves whose own legacy um, is now something that enriches and benefits, you know, the generation after and the generation after, you know, of Rabbanim. <laughs> And that's a very remarkable thing. And Rabbi Schoenfeld and my father were really, um, as I say, in the forefront of that. Uh, on a personal note, you know, um, thinking about my father and, you know, his involvement in the medical council and so on, that uh, Avi Mori Harini Kaparis Mishkavo was really totally defined, you know, by the relationship that he had uh, and the lifelong experience of being a Talmud um, of the Rav's. And that is something that continued um, if it's authentic, it has to continue well after the Rav's Ptira. Uh, my father's last uh, project or endeavor um, was to try to work on an article, um, you know, uh, on his experiences in the Rav Shir and, you know, in the RCA um, in terms of leadership under the Rav's um, tutelage. Um, it was a little bit difficult to get my father to um, accept new projects um, in the last couple of years. But the only thing that really worked was <laughs> invoking the Rav's name, um, whether it was writing or a couple of years back, about five years back uh, in the yeshiva when they had a yard site. My father actually came out, which was rare at that time already, um, and spoke at night in the base medrash, um, Li'ilui Nishmaso. So, you know, we uh, in our family, um, if you visit my father, you know, the picture behind me, you know, was on the wall. We you know, treasured that picture. And right across in that picture was a picture that he put of, of his Rebbe, of the Rav um, Zatzal, very prominently um, displayed. And um, we grew up, you know, understanding that, you know, there's this concept of authority with the encouragement of uh, personal growth and independence, you know, alongside that, but in the right proportion. And, you um, that was really something that was transformative for us uh, in our home as well. On a personal level, um, I grew up, you know, before I knew who the Rav was and, and you know, many other things, just through osmosis, um, hearing the name and understanding the concepts um, of authority and hierarchy and the Sora. And um, 
of course, my first exposure to high-level Talmud Torah, um, again, for sure, um, you know, in the image of, you know, brisk, mostly because of the Rav's, Rav's Hashpa'a, was listening to my father's um, Shabbos Shuvah and Shabbos Hagadol Drashos um, twice yearly. His regular shiurim too, but those were very special. Those were, um, you know, constructed to be on a different level. And that was, for me, very inspiring and, you know, very impactful. And, um, right, so it's very, you know, uh, to be invited to speak, you know, to give a share, but to kind of highlight some approaches of the derech of brisk um, in memory of Rabbi Schoenfeld and Rabbi Father, who were such, uh, as I say, special talmidim, is really something um, that is very, very um, special. And um, certainly was a pathway for me. My own six years in the Rod Shear were, um, you know, indelibly um, connected to that um, Hagdama and to my father's impact and to the, you know, influence of the other Abunim and Queens and of the RCA who, who I knew very well and, and valued very greatly. Anyways, um, before I actually, uh, you know, begin with the Shear, just a, another word, kind of a little bit of word of apprehension. Um, obviously, no one shear can um, capture uh, the world of brisk. The world of brisk itself is, you know, a complex world and and a world which is hardly, um, you know, univocal. But um, and it's certainly not just a methodology of, um, you know, giving a shear or even solving a particular problem. Um, what we learned from the Rav, you know, and what he articulates so magnificently in in Isha Halacha. And what he reflected in, in his entire, you know, career um, as, you know, Talmud Torah, leadership, et cetera, is that, um, you know, Brisk um, is part of the Mesorah of, uh, of, of Halacha and Torah, but even more so, it's a derach hachashiva. It's a way of thinking. Uh, it's a conceptual way of, uh, of looking at Torah and seeing Torah not merely as something that is um, transcendent and unfathomable. It's certainly both of those things also, uh, but not merely as something which, you know, is um, kind of broken down into, you know, details and halachos and mitzvos, all opportunities which we are obligated to pursue, but uh, which is a system which is also accessible um, through hard work. And uh, we're intended to be the junior partners of the Rabota Shalom as we stand in the aftermath of Chag HaShavuos, the Chag of Lachem, actually, Ilav um, Yoma Kama Yosi Ika Beshuka, because it's Yom Shenitna Botorah, we're intended to be the partners of the Rabbi Shalom, and therefore it's our obligation to understand to the best of our ability, you know, the concepts of Torah, um, and then, um, you know, to understand them and apply them and to understand them more deeply, and to let them then impact um, who we are, how we think, um, how we apply the halacha as a system of values, um, even beyond the details of the halacha. The halacha, you know, and the psaq of the Shulchan Aruch is only the beginning. Um, it, you know, if we understand it properly and understand the principles behind it, um, is what motivates us to pursue in a maximalist way, um, you know, implementing those principles and values, um, even in a more um, maximalist and comprehensive way. So when you speak about, you know, the derech of brisk, we're not just talking about how you learn a Mishnah or how you learn a Gemara, more, you know, I guess associatively how you learn a Rambam, but um, uh, we're talking really about a perspective which declares that the halacha is implications of the derech of risk, but just touching on it, but that the halacha is, you know, not uh, simply, you know, um, the source of normative uh, necessary conduct, but that it stands at the center of our um, worldview, our Weltanschauung, you can say, and uh, that there are, um, you know, in a, in a deep understanding of these values, there is a way of life and a way of thinking, which we are supposed to internalize and um, which is supposed to, to use one of the Rub's phrases, become a kind of prism through which we encounter and respond to um, 
you know, issues, reality, and um, in which we make our contributions, our nofach bishalano, the combination of our own experiences, personality, um, and our understanding of what that system and prism um, is all about. So, you know, the world of brisk isn't uh, about solving, you know, just difficult rambams. It really is about, as I say, a way of thinking, um, which, you know, is is, fraught, is filled with all sorts of uh, fascinating implications um, about uh, Torah life, Torah values, Torah perspectives, um, and so on. For today, we'll certainly suffice um, with discussing um, the first Mishnah, which is what I was asked to discuss, I think, and the first Sugya in Kiddushin, which of course, you know, uh, touches on um, a much bigger question. And I do want to focus uh, in particular <laughs> on Shita Sarambam. And of course, uh, time doesn't allow, you know, a very comprehensive um, presentation here, but I'll try at least to underscore and highlight, you know, some of the main points and to kind of identify what I think, um, again, is particularly um, relevant, you know, to, to the derech of brisk or the conceptual approach more generally. Okay, so um, let's start with the beginning. The first Mishnah in Kiddushan Dabbe Saman Aleph, of course, a famous Mishnah. Um, and we're immediately struck um, when we read the Mishnah, you know, by the, we immediately encounter let's say, the challenge or the difficulty. Misha says, Aisha nicknames Begimel Drachim, the Kones Atzma Bishte Drachim, Niknes Bekasa Bishtaro Bibia, Bekasef Besham Yom Rabdina Bisham Adina, Besil Omer Bipruta Bisham Bipruta, Kamehi Pruta, Acha Mishwana Bisa Ritalki, Kones Atzma Begetu Misa Sabal, and then we have a, a parallel with Yavama, which we're not going to discuss now, although it's fascinating that it's here. The, the difficulty um, is apparent, um, and there are multiple difficulties, um, you know, as well. Um, question is whether they are related to each other, and I'm going to suggest kind of a unified approach. The first difficulty, of course, is in the second word uh, of the Mishnah, and that is the word nicknase. Um, typically, our um, the connotation of nicknames is something that we associate with the world of Chosha uh, Mishpat, um, you know, with the world of uh, Bava Kama, or even more Bava Basra, and actually, which is highlighted um, as we go forward in the first parak of Kiddushan, but we don't typically associate the word Kenyan you know, with uh, with Ishas. I mean, we're familiar with this Mishnah and it has tremendous impact. So, you know, maybe we do. But I mean, conceptually, in terms of the, normally we think of Kenyan as acquisition, um, as ownership. And uh, those are not terms that we readily associate, um, you know, with Ishas, which is about a Kesha or bond relationship. So the first thing to do when we encounter this Mishnah um, is, you know, even if there's no technical question, there's no stira, you know, to another Gemara necessarily. We'll get to that in a moment. Actually, you know, the Gemara does identify that there is a textual, you know, and more um, narrow problem as well. And that is the discrepancy. Why is it that the, this Mishnah says, Ha'isha Niknes, the Gemara points out, Ha'isha Niknes, Ma'ish Nohachitatani, Ha'isha Niknes, Ma'ish Nohasimatani, Ha'ish Mekadesh. Second paragraph of Kiddushin begins with Ha'ish uh, Mekadesh. Tosis in, uh, in the beginning of Masachet Ksuvos um, notes that um, there the language of the mission is Besula, you know, uh, Nises. They don't use the language of opinion there either. And uh, it is a passive language like Isha Niknes. But um, obviously there's a difference between the language opinion used with association, in association with Isha's uh, with Arison and um, and the language of the Nisuin. So from a, a technical point of view, the use of the term Kenyan um, raises all sorts of questions in terms of other sources. Why don't we have like a consistent uh, usage, um, et cetera. Now, again, you can look at that in a narrow way. The, you know, the Talmud is, you know, made up of uh, Mishnayas and Toseftas and Brises and Gemaras and, and so on. And we're trying to figure it out. And 
if there are contradictions or even just anomalies, we're, we're interested and we're curious about them. <laughs> if you take a more conceptual approach, it doesn't have to be only brisk, frankly. Um, you know, it's important to distinguish brisk from um, conceptual learning more general. I'm not going to be able to do that today, but that's an important point. So then you might say that some of these textual questions are um, not merely, you know, they, they kind of extend beyond, they transcend the questions themselves. Like when you're, if you're a conceptual thinker, then, uh, you know, the use of um, different terminology in different place, places with different connotation is also likely to sensitize you, you know, for you to begin thinking that maybe we're dealing with different principles and concepts rather than the same idea that's, you know, for some reason being depicted, you know, by um, or with, you know, different terminology. <laughs> so I guess if you're a conceptual thinker, you're, you know, your antennae are already, you know, more sensitive. But as I say, even before that, the use of the term nicknase, Kenyan, which has a Scotia Mishpat connotation to an Ishus reality. Uh, and again, you don't have to be a modernist who is offended, you know, by the language, you know, of Kenyan acquisition, ownership, um, you know, to be noticing this and to be uh, you know, wondering whether it's significant. Per se, the language of Kenyan is, uh, is an issue that is uh, questionable. Um, in terms of its legal accuracy. Um, for that reason, the Me'iri al-Atar uh, makes a point of the fact, <clears throat> uh, without you know, actually announcing it, but it's very, very clear that this is what troubles him, uh, to limit the, the meaning of the word nicknes. The nicknes doesn't mean uh, ownership or acquisition. It means legabe labala, with respect, says the Me'iri, to the requirement that you need a get or misa sabal in order to exit um, this relationship. It's his way of saying, but it's not a typical Kenyan. And elsewhere, we'll get to in just a moment, um, where the Gemara speaks about the possibility, the Havamina, that maybe there could have been a Kenyan, uh, Arison, Balkarcha, de Isha against her will. The Meiri says there never really was such a Havamina. Um, number one, it's not typical of Kenyanim that you could do something coercively under duress, uh, but he says, in addition, this isn't really a typical Kenyan. The Me'iri actually is discussion of the entire um, first suga, base of an olive base and base. He says, uh, you know, many people ask many questions about the language. He says, uh, it's, it's a different kind of a Kenyan. It's not the same Kenyan. So the Me'iri is clearly avoiding the implications uh, of the word Kenyan. Uh, Rashi and Davyod and Aleph, in a different context, here the Gemara speaks about Yibum, um, the Gemara says, um, yavam and, aleph. and it's noted by the Achronim. Rashi says, Vim beget. Again, it sounds like Rashi, Miri may have taken it from Rashi, is um, limiting or circumscribing um, the significance of Kenyan. And this is a whole um, you know, discussion um, in the Rishonim, again, a topic, uh, several Shiurim in their own right. When the Gemara on Daf Hay compares Kedushan to Kenyan, Pidjon, uh, uh, Hektesh, or Meiser Shani, so um, some of the Rishonim comment, you know, about how seriously we should take, you know, that equation. And then it's Siv, in his Bromei um, Sada, um, uh, you know, has a whole discussion about the, how, you know, how significant the term Kenyan is and what we mean by it in the context um, of Isha's. <laughs> In the Sugha of Makadish Milva, in the first parak, um, both the Rajba and the Ritva weigh in on um, you know, whether this is a typical Kenyan um, or not. And there are different you know, views, there's a range of views in the Rishonim, but clearly this is a sensitive issue. Not, it wasn't politically sensitive and not in the ancient world and not in the medieval world. It is in the modern world, you know, and, um, but the Rishonim were sensitive to it because just objectively, um, nothing to do with political, you know, um, implications or social implications, uh, but just objectively, they were wondering um, to what extent this is the proper term to be used here. So Aisha Nicknes already requires um, a deeper um, understanding. The fact that, um, and the Gemara again um, discusses Kicha Kicha Bistei Afron, making this, reinforcing the idea that this is something serious, Aisha Ishisha, 
מסעתי כסף הצד הכך ממני, כי חי קרי קניין, דרסיב הצד אשר קנה אברהם, אינם יסדס בכסף יקנו, תעני האישה נקנס. Then the Gemara says, well, what about im kvar az kvar? Why don't you align this thinking with the second parak? Vinisni hasam ha'ish kona. Then the Gemara ultimately says that the language of ha'ish mekadesh, my lishad rabbanan, the asar is a lishad rabbanan, the asar kula alma kehektesh. Then the Gemara says, vinisni hacha ha'ish kona, instead of ha'ish niknes. The Gemara ultimately says, because you might have thought that you could be mekadesh and isha bal karcha, Kamash itani kona have a kona have a mida bal karcha. Tanei shenikneis to midaita in shalom midaita lo. So again, uh, from a purely textual, technical, narrow point of view, there are things to discuss uh, in both in the language of the Mishnah and the discussions of the Gemara. If you are a conceptually oriented thinker and you think that the Gemara mostly is you know about that, then you know there's a. Um, the implications, we call it the symbolic significance of the terminology that you use, whether you emphasize the activity of the Baal or the passivity of the Isha, whether you um, underscore the language of uh, Kona or some other language, um, you know, the, you've kind of raised the stakes. What we're really trying to figure out here is what is the true nature of Kiddushin such that we have these multiple terms as a certain um, either m- multiple mechaivim or maybe a common denominator, but we're trying to say something about the singular nature of this Kenyan, and therefore we're using, you know, different terminology to cover different dimensions of it or um, to, you know, in combination, you know, more precisely depict, you know, what exactly um, it is. And that a very fascinating thing, but of course it's a very complex thing. So that, that's what we're looking at. Um, in addition, now again, I, before I get to the in addition, of course there is another possible um, you know, perspective, on, especially on the Kenyan point, um, which I think is true no matter what, and that is that to, by using the terminology Ha'isha Nikneis um, and by confronting you know, um, the seeming Chosha Mishpat as I say, implications of that, which don't seem to capture Kedusha Sishas, um, maybe we're forced also to re-examine the broader concept of Kenyan, or at least to consider that. And that is that typically most Kenyanim that we are familiar with um, do express themselves in ownership, in acquisition, um, in a gavra, and a chefza, you know, you own an it, an I owns an it. However, um, maybe Kiddushin and Gibum and Gerushin, etc., maybe they push us and force us to, you know, take a more subtle and maybe more accurate approach. And that is that while uh, ownership acquisition, uh, while the implication, you know, of, uh, of, of ownership, you know, typically um, point to a chefza, a gavra and a chefza, Maybe that simply happens to be, you know, um, experientially, and maybe even, you know, for good reason, you know, the large, large, large majority of Kenyanim in the world. But it doesn't mean it defines Kenyan. A more accurate definition of Kenyan, perhaps, is about legal relationships. Most legal relationships are about eyes and its. There are also significant, maybe more significant legal relationships that govern the interaction of, um, of two individuals. Um, what exactly is the nature of the bond or the commitment, um, the legal right uh, interaction between them? So if Kenyan means um, not acquisition or ownership, but a legal bond and a legal relationship, something which is formalized and which implies, um, you know, commitment, um, then the use of that in Ishus is actually um, not only reasonable, but actually very compelling. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. We just read a couple of words. Ha'isha Nikneis, the other thing to look at is the range of the Mishnah. Um, typically, Kesef, Shtar, and Bia would not be on a single list. And in the other direction, of course, um, get 
and Bisa Sabah. Again, these are each one of these is a topic in its own right. I'm just trying to, in addition, give you addition to trying to make a couple of content or substantive points about the first Asugi and Kiddushin, just also just, you know, try to expose, I guess, you know, what, how conceptual thinking, you know, takes place or what is conceptual thinking, I guess. So obviously once you have star, the possibility of having get is reasonable, <laughs> but um, Misa Sabal is not something that we typically associate, certainly with um, typical Kenyan reinforces the idea that I mentioned before, that it's about legal relationship. But even more than that, um, it forces us to look at some of the sugyas of Misa Sabal. Um, it seems that there's evidence, this is a topic, that Misa Sabal is not just about the absence of a husband, right? And, and therefore Mimela, right? The, um, the heter, um, the freedom or the, you know, the, the absence of a marriage you know, to impose any kind of restrictions on a, on a wife, RCA. it's really about, it's really about a matir. It's about ending a relationship that Zoom. is so transcendent that in some respects it outlasts um, life itself. And therefore there's need for a matir. And of course we know this to be the case in, con in things like Ibum, where the Zika continues, in issues of Kurva um, in aspects of Yerusha. So once again, the the fact that the list on the other side includes Misa Sabal raises questions about it, but also reinforces the idea that we're dealing with a broader notion of Kenyan here. The fact that the range within Kedushan itself includes Kesef, Shtar, and Bia is um, also a topic. Um, again, Kesef and Shtar, they coexist on Choshen Mishpat lists as well. Um, Kiddush Ebiya, obviously, um, seems anomalous here. And while there's lines in the Yushalmi and some Rishonim and Achronim who try to suggest that Kiddush Ebiya is a kind of Kinyan Chazaka, you know, um, for Ishus, which has some merit, um, the idea that, you know, again, even the Kesef and the Shtar are means to establish a bond uh, or to formalize that bond, but that we're not talking about any kind of actual ownership or acquisition, is something, again, reinforced by Kiddushé Bia. The fact that Kiddushé Bia um, is treated differently in some contexts is a topic in its own right. In other words, are the three methods of Kiddushin, um, do they underscore different dimensions of Ishus? They're both, all three create Ishus Ish, all three require a get, all three create, you know, a heter, you know, Isha Labala. All three create the status of Erosin. But perhaps they do it in ways that accentuate, you know, different dimensions of a complex um, institution. Um, Kesef accentuating the Choshem Mishpat part, Shtar, you know, especially if it's based on Biyatsa Vahaisa, being an internal Kenyan, but internal Ishus, a, a, a Kenyan that is unique to Ishus. Um, and of course, Kiddush Ebiya being something which underscores the intimacy and the Ishus aspect in a more um, frontal way. So the fact that the Gemara Daf Yudom and Aleph um, wonders, and I won't get into the Psak in the moment of the Ramam Shita and so on, but whether whether Bia Eirusinose or Bia Nisuinose, the Gemara considers the possibility that Kiddush Ebiya doesn't require two stages, all that is very significant. If it's true, even the Maskana in part, which it may be for the Rambam, um, it's even more significant. But even isolating the Gemara's question, the Gemara never asked whether Kesa for Shtar is the Suinosa. The Gemara in Suvis Tafayin Dalad Omad Aleph discusses, um, you know, whether, um, you know, why does it you can make a Tznai and have Shlichos um, in certain institutions? The Gemara says, Koshiation of Shlichos, Koshiation of Tznai. So the Gemara says, and what about Kiddushé Bia? Of course, it's Eino uh, B'Shlichos, so it should be Eino <laughs> B'Tznai. The Gemara says, Iskish, right, Havayos Vahadadi. So there are two ways to read that Gemara, conceptually, right? <laughs> I mean, the Gemara is saying that there are two very different ways of achieving Ishus, right? But 
But as much as we acknowledge that Kedusha Bia, you know, is a different role, it's a different route, you know, to Ishus, and maybe even our Navkamina, in the end of the day, it's still Iska Shavayas Lahadadi. It's Kiyikach, Ish, Uba'ala, it's all one Pasuk, and so on. Or no, is the Gemara saying that Mide Kidushe Kasafushtar Nishma Le Kidushe Bia, U Mide Kidushe Bia Nishma Le Kidushe Kasafushtar, meaning, um, and it's possible that both of these are true. It's possible that each method of Kidushin, each mode of Kidushin accentuates a different aspect of Ishas. And the fact that any one of them will lead to the same conclusion is also significant in highlighting um, what Ishus is for each and all of them. It's fascinating if you look at the Rambam. <laughs> you know, the Rambam has a very famous view about Divrei Sofrim, we're all familiar with. And the Rambam says a Kiddushe Kesef is mi Divrei Sofrim um, because it's derived from Kicha Kicha. Um, very complicated issue of the Rambam, I don't want to get to right now. But if you look at the language of the Rambam, and I won't because it'll take too much time for now, but look up in Perak Aleph, um, you know, Halach Aleph and Base. I'll get to those of Sonos in just a minute in the Rambam. And again in Perak Gimel Halach Achaf, and in Sefer Mitzvos, Mitzvah Se Reshid Gimel, and in Pirish Mishnai is Base Amad Aleph. Okay, and all four play, and in the Chuva that the Rambam writes, in all five places, where the Ramam discusses this topic, it's fascinating to note that especially in three or four of them, he very subtly, you know, uses his formulation to accomplish two different goals, two, op two seemingly opposite goals, but they're not. One goal is to show you that all the Jarke Kedushin, Kesef Shtar and Bia work, and they all generate Kedusha Doraisa in the same way. And at the same time, the language that he uses um, underscores that they just work. I'll read the language in just a couple minutes, one of them, very differently. And I believe that the Ramam very subtly is telling us that the Dark Hakidushin underscore different motifs in Ishus, although any one of them will lead to that result. And it's important to know what that hierarchy is. It's important for the Ramam to know that Kidushe Bia is Mufurish Bakra. It's important for him to know, for you to know that. Kesef is a kind of what I call an import from the world of Chosha Mishpat. And it's important to know that Shtar is somewhere in between in that it is more of a typical formal Kenyan type as opposed to an intimate Tchila Saishus, even as it's internal, it's not from Chosha Mishpat, it's from Get, from Yad Tzavahis. Okay, so the point is that once you read this, of course, once you know a lot about the topic and the Mepharshim is the only topic, and you look back in the Mishnah, so Ha'isha Nikneis, A, and everything that it pulls that comes with it, Begimel Drachim, the range of the three and the relationship between them, and then the Kones Atzma, which especially that includes Misa Sabal, all these Enam Omer Ela Darsheni, I mean, this is the first Mishnah in Masachat Kedushin, so it's written in such a provocative in a way, in such a way as to raise so many questions, you know, kind of push, you know, so many, you know, frontiers, um, if you will. Then you take a step back and um, think about the following, and that is the phenomenon, the halachic phenomenon of Ishus, which this mission, of course, you know, also helps to describe. And that is that Ishus has two shlavim, it has two stages. There's the Arison part, and there, I'm being very neglectful of my, sorry. There's the Arison part, and there is the um, Nisuan part. The idea that uh, one institution, Ishus, right, includes two components is a phenomenon. It's a legal phenomenon. Like, why does it need to be that way? Um, this is particularly accentuated. Oh, maybe I'll already take the Rambam. <laughs> By the contrast to other cultures, which the Rambam himself um, obviously considers to be important enough, either to register or to register as a contrast. In my opinion, 
um, both. So the Raman begins Hilchos um, just by saying, "Kodem Matan Torah Adam Pogia Isha Bishuk." Prior to Matan Torah, and for other cultures, you know, um, man and woman would agree. You know, they'd meet each other. There would be, you know, uh, an agreement between them. A cons- cons- consensual uh, relationship would develop. In Ratzah Huvihi, Lisa Osa, Machnisa Lebeso Baala Beno Levenatz Mavatiel Ali Isha. Pre Matan Torah. The Ramam speaks about, and when he talks about other cultures, he talks about Nisuin, and he talks about Mia, Bia, and Beno Levein Atzmo. Kivin Shinit, the Torah, Nitztavu Yisrael, once the Torah was given, now we, this is the drum roll, this is, you know, what is the contribution of Matan Torah to the incredibly important institution of Ishus? Kivin Shinit, the Torah, Nitztavu Yisrael, Shem Yirtza Ha'ish, Lisa Ish, every word of the Rambam here is, Golden and difficult, or difficult and golden, I should say. If Yirtsa Ha'ish Lisa Isha, still the language of Nisuin, Yikne Osa Techila, he should acquire her, or he should make a Kenyan, Bifne Edim, Yachakach Tila Isha, Shinamak Yikach Ish Isha, Uba Eleha. So what the Rambam, you know, is subtly saying here, and then later on he'll say it more explicitly, is that Matan Torah. Is a revolution. It's a revolution in the world of Ishas. Typically, marriage, which is respected even for B'nai Noach, um, it could betray a marriage. That's that's a, one of the violations of Shabbos B'nai Noach. Um, but according to the Rambam, you know, the change of Matan Torah is twofold. Number one, Arison was it was split from Nisuin. Two stages instead of one were developed. And number two, um, Ede Kiyum were required. The presence of Adam were necessary for Kiddushin. But subtly, um, you know, interspersed in all of this, I mean, the Ramam is, is, is weighing in on the language of Aisha Nikneis and Kicha Kicha Mistayafron of the first Mishnah in Kiddushan. So in addition to wondering about all the things that we wondered about in the Mishnah, we now know that the Rambam zeroes in on that word, and that the Rambam, for some reason, felt it important to contrast pre and post Matan Torah, to identify the contributions of Matan Torah, and the identification of Kenyan, of Edekiyum, um, but also, even more importantly, implicitly, of splitting Kedushin from Nisuin, of having a pre-stage, are critical. The Rambam does not deal with Nisuin until Perik Yud of Hilchasishas. That's when he begins his discussion. So from Kozmanchi Beisavia, Bala Rosasa Bebeis Chamiv, and so on. Kivshin Nechusu Lachupa Rezum Mater, the entire dinam of Nisuin is only in Parakid, meaning there is Masachet uh, Kiddushin and there's Masachet Ksuvas, Basula Nises, right? And Aisha Nikneis. Smaller wonder why the language of Kenyan is not used, right, at least in the Mishnah, when it comes to Nisu. So the question is, in addition to the language of Kenyan, the, you know, the range, Kesef Shtarubia, um, the contrast, including Misa, which is what implies the need for a matir on the way out because of a very transcendent relationship, which theoretically could even outlive, you know, one of the parties, etc. In addition to all of that, right, we now have um, the question of why the Torah itself, or why Matan Torah introduced Kenyan, two stages, and Eid Ekiyum. We have to consider that question um, uh, as well. Okay, so let, let's go a step um, even further um, further than that. The other um, takeaway from the first daf in Kiddushin is equally fascinating. The Gemara says that the second parak, the mission of the second parak is Ish Kadesh, not the language of Kenyan. And at the end of the day, what they wanted to extract from that was 
that's lishna drabanan. What, what's the point of the lishna drabanan? The asar kula alma kehektesh. The asar kula alma kehektesh is the language of kedushin, and we know that you know this stage of ishus is described sometimes as erusin and sometimes as kedushin. <laughs> okay, so um, it's masachet kedushin, even though it's a isha nicknames. Now this idea that kedushin is based on the language of Asara Kula Amaka Hektesh is also very peculiar. Again, we're all familiar with it. And, you know, like the Mesil Sisharim, you know, in a Musa context, you know, noted in his, his Akdama, you know, we tend to overlook the significance of um, things that we are just very familiar with. You know, we don't appreciate their novelty sometimes. You have to kind of take a step back. You have to be, have the ability to take a step back so <laughs> Kiddushin is called Kiddushin because of Asar Kulama Kehektesh. You know, Eilacha negative campaigning, you know, Godel Mizu, you're celebrating this uh, bond, you know, this transcendent, uh, you know, um, um, link, you know, which gives meaning and riches, you know, life, the, the foundation of the family unit, you know, and, and every all rhapsodic things that we could say about uh, the importance of marriage. Say Bekadish Israel, a marriage, we'll get that soon. And the best you could call it is Kiddushin to Asar Akula Amaka Hektish. That she's off. What did he do? What's a great accomplishment? Not Hetzarisha Labala, right? Not even the Kenyan, the bond between them, or the bond only vis a vis the Osir. But this phenomenon, you know, is not. Um, isolated to the, again, it could hardly be considered isolated since mostly that's what we call the institution Kiddushin, but um, even if it were, it's also all over the bracha, right? The Birch HaSerusin, which the Gemara in Ksuvis and Avzayin Amid Beis describes <laughs> so vividly, you're all Rabbanim, so Everybody's been the son of Kedushin at one point or another. We are all, all familiar with this, you know, remarkable bracha. Very, very uh, multi-themed, complex, long bracha, right? Uh, very, very long bracha, which defies the typical madbeya uh, shal bracha. As the Rishonim, you know, all point out, the Rush in particular, we'll get back to that hopefully in just a minute as well. <clears throat> the point is that um, part of that bracha is, you know, after, it, I mean, it starts with Vitzivano al Arayos, which is peculiar. Talk about negative campaigning and, you know, a, a, a sour note, you know, in a romantic and, and you know, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, Sanctified, cherished moment. The first thing that the Masada Kedushin says, or the Brach Bircha Seiros, and says, "Tzivano Alo Arayos." It's true. I mean, the Rush asks the question. The Rush in Ksuvis, <laughs> not going to read anything. But the Rush says, "What? You make a Brach on Shkita. You talk about the. You say Yashcher Kedushanu, but it's also Tzivano. You know, Al Eber Menachai or Al Devela. You know, all of a sudden, Tzivano Alo Arayos. But the next one is Va'asar Lanu S." Arusos. So it's Osar Kulama Kehektesh, right? And it's Vaosar Lanu Eso Arusos. That's the first thing. Then the Hitu Lanu Samusuos. But that is only Alide Chupa the Kiddushin. This is the Birchas Eruzin, it's not the Birchas Nesuin. So, like, what's going on? Why are we accentuating the negative? And what do we mean when we say the Osar Lanu Eswarusos? <laughs> to highlight the question even more, let me just mention Shitas. I'm going to mention a couple of Shitas very quickly. <laughs> Shitas Araibid. The Raibid quoted in Shiti Shana and Shita Mukubetsas and Ksubas and Atres. Um, it's a minority view, but in my opinion, the minority view of great Chachmiya Mesora even if you don't pass it like them, often, you know, we, we need to know what they thought, how they understood things. But often, even if we don't pass it like them, they highlight normative principles, 
it's you have to figure out in each case whether this is true or not um but in a more moderate way so the rivet says is uh, a dindoraisa the rivet says when you uh, are makadesh and not yet um no say Isha, you actually take a step backwards she is more usher to you than before. The Ravid uses the expression, believe it or not, that she's an Aishas Ish. What you, she's an Aishas Ish, meaning she's more usher than she was when she was a Penuya. There's also the view of the Yad Ramah, the Likud Yad Ramah, that they put out on Masachat Kedushan, the Asar Kulama Kehektesh. He says, vis-a-vis, even vis-a-vis, she's an Aishas Ish, even vis-a-vis the husband. Now, of course, it Shalo, you know, tachuli avana, as they say, you know, no one thinks that a Baal Arusaso is Chai Misa for violating Eshesish, because she's his Eshesish. I would say there's no Begida. You know, the Marik has a very famous Ha'ara. Um, the Marik says, when the Torah says a Mala Bo Mal, that shows, it doesn't say Mala Bashem Mal. That's the famous Marik. Marik says that, you know, it's a matter of Part of the requirement of a woman to be, you know, faithful to her husband is because of begida. It's a it's a kind of relationship which doesn't tolerate um, any kind of, you know, you know, betrayal. It's a personal betrayal. Um, so what I would explain using the Marik is, of course, for the Ravid and the Rama, they they're certainly not suggesting that Yechayev Misa for being Baal Eishasish. If Aurus is Baal Arusa, it's Asur, but it's not Chayim Misa. But that's because there's no Begida. She's his Eishasish. But the formulation that we're talking about Eishasish after Eirson, even for the husband, highlights that the Kenyan, the Kiddushin, the Asur Kula Makaktesh, the Asur Sarusos, according to the Rabbi Ibn Doraisa, is a step back. It's a step of intensifying. The distance between husband, it's an, what I'll call an oser. Not only is it not a matir, it's not even neutral. Other Rishonim disagree. Some of them say it's neutral. It's a didra The Rambam doesn't say it's doraisa, but he does call it divrei sofrim. And in Hilcha Sota, he talks about uh, being naki, you know, for a sota, partially that we just read in Torah, just this past Shabbos. Ram gives the example of Baal Arusasa Beis Khan. It sounds like there's a Kiyum Doraisa in violating Arusa Baal Arusa. Not quite as extreme as the Ravid or the Rama. So, what does it mean when we say, again, other Rishonim disagree? The Ritva even thinks that you are, it's less than Pinuya, although it's not Mutter. But according to the Rambam, and according to the Ravid, and according to the Rama, the Asar Lanuas Arusos, the Asar Kulama Kehekdesh, is uh, is very perplexing. Let me go one step further, because time is running out. There's a huge debate regarding Chitas Arambam. Right? What is the mitzvah? Uh, mostly, it's perfectly clear in the Rambam that the mitzvah of Ishus is limited to Kiddushin. And not to Nisuin. The Ram only speaks about Nisuin and Perak Yud, and his language is mostly, you'll see what I mean in a moment, clear. After describing the Chiddush of Matan Torah in Perak Aleph, Allah Aleph, which we just read, the Ram says, Vili Kuchinelu, this Kicha Kicha, which I've just described as a Kenyan, Mitzvah Sasei Shal Torah. It's a positive commandment of the Torah. The only thing that's called Kicha in the Torah is Kiddushin, Kicha Chishishim. And then he Perfectly clear. Right? And here's the language, one of the you know venues in the Rambam that I was referring to before. Listen to the language. Later, he says in Perak Gimel Halacha that each one works and has a different status. Looks like the quintessential. The chain bishtar miskadeshes bo minat Torah. Kishem shtegomer megarish. 
the Tzivah Kassel will say for Purusos, Kach Gomer Machnas, and finds it necessary to add that. Avala Kassel, Midi Vresofer. In all three, in all the places that it does. Anyway, so the Ram says here, perfectly clear, that Likuchin Elohim Nikroim Kedushin, O Eirisin, Chomakom, Isha Nikris Bechad Migamal Dvar Melu, Kia Nikris Mikudeshes, Omba Ureses, right? The Kivin Shaniknes, Venasas Mikudeshes, Afa Bishalo Nibala, Chai Mises Pet, the whole bit. It's perfectly clear for the Rambam that the mitzvah of Kiddushin is limited to Eirisin. <laughs> However, the Rambam in the Koteret to Hilchas Ishas says Lisa Isha Biksuva Bikidushin. Why does he mention Lisa here? And it's Sefer Mitzvah similarly. Rabbi Avram ben Rambam quoted also on the Kesef Mishnah said, oh, my father's view was that the mitzvah of Kiddushin is really not Kiddushin, it's the mitzvah of Kiddushin the Nisuin, right? And the Ikar is the Nisuin. And it tries to be a riot from the Gemara in Moed Katan on Dafid Chesom Dveis, which I'm not going to get into right now, even though it would highlight what I want to say, but I'll leave it for now. But the evidence is all against Rabbi Avram and Arama for the reasons I just mentioned. It's perfectly clear in the Rambam he's not talking about Nisu, although we do have to explain what he means in the Kotera. And it's perfectly clear in Sefer Mitzvot, and it's perfectly clear in the Tshuva um, as well. So, like, in addition to what do you do with the Gemara Moed Kata that he quotes, which is part of the discussion, like, what is going on in the Rambam? Why isn't the mitzvah the Nesuin, which is the goal, even a Birchah Seirisen, it's the goal, right? Uh, the Rishonim are all troubled why we mention Nisuin in Birchah Seirisen and why we mention it first, both in the text and in the Chasimah. Very strange. <laughs> so what really is, if the mit, why is the mitzvah the... Not, not the Nisu. What, one of the things that motivated Rabbi Avram and Rambam was the conceptual question. What you're celebrating the mitzvah is is the Iser, the Aser Lanu is Arusos. Of course, the mitzvah is the Nisuin, but it's not. It's not even clear that the Rambam requires a Dikim for Nisuin. We are, we're Machmir Lahalacha Lamaisa when we're Masada Kedushin, but. To have you know Adam see the Nisuin, whatever it is. I even have them see the Badekin. But in the Rambam, it's there's no mention in Perikud the Chasisha that you need a Kiyo. The Rambam in general, this is something that Rab Chaim pointed out with regard to Das and other things. Um, the Rambam seems to how old that there's a dichotomy between the requirements of Arison. And Nisuin. Arison is a real Kenyan. Arison requires Das. Arison requires Edi Kiyum. Arison, a father, can't consent after the fact. In the case of Katana, he's got to consent up front. And none of this applies to Nisuin. It's strange. I mean, why is the Kenyan, the formal part, the Osir, the the distance, the greater distance that you create, first of all, why do you need greater distance? And then why are you celebrating that? The Ramam says in Perikyodala Tuchos Brachos, I mean, oh, we'll say it this way. Yeah, okay. In Perikyodala Tuchos Brachos, the Ramam says that if you have a mitzvah mimusheches, a mitzvah that continues, like tefillin or, or tzitzes, something like that. So even if you don't make a bracha over la siyasan, which you should, nonetheless, it's not too late because you're still wearing the tzitzes, wearing the tefillin, etc. However, if you have a single action, you know, not a, a, a continuing process, right, but a, a standalone mitzvah, so then you have to make the bracha of lasiyasan. And if you don't, then, you know, it's muva shalayucha litkon, and it's a bracha levatala. And the Ram repeats the same exact thing in Paragimel, Hilchosishus, you know, Halacha, Chav Gimel. Ram says, if you don't make Bechas Eresin in advance, then it's too late. Nothing you can do. If Rabbi Ram and Rambam were right, that the Nesuin is part of the mitzvah, the Ikar mitzvah, why can't you make the Bechas Eresin all the way till, till the Nesuin? It, it's clearly just not correct. But that leaves us in a quandary, right? Why? 
do we call it Kedushin in a negative way? Why do we emphasize Asar Lanu Asar Rusos? What really is the relationship between these two stages? The amount of Shach, they're not totally separate from each other. Why would the Torah emphasize one as the mitzvah rather than, than the other? It's counterintuitive. Why would the first Mishnah highlight Kenyan? Why would that be the contribution of Mat Torah? So let me just say, short circuit all this, say the following. The uh, Gaonim already asked the question that Heichan Matzinu, it's very rare that a bracha concludes Mekadesh, speaks about Kedush Yisrael in the end. We have here and there, Kedush Hashem, other things, right? But most brachos, you know, I'll mitzvah tefillin, I'll, you know, so on and so forth. Rarely does a bracha in its chasima Right, refer back to Kedusha Yisrael. Mekadesh Amo Yisrael or Mekadesh Amo Yisrael Al Yidei Chuba This is something that bothered the Gonim. But I always thought that um, the evidence, you know, based on the first Mishnah and the first Sugya, based especially on the Rambam's understanding of it and some of these issues that I'm raising, really encapsulate, you know, a very integrated approach. And what we're really being told about the mitzvah of Kiddushin from the very Mishnah itself, from the from the range of the Mishnah, from the you know comprehensiveness of the lists and their seeming incompatibility, but apparently not, right? From the language of Kenyan, from the interchangeable usages, you know, of uh, Kicha and and Kiddushin and Erosin from the centrality of, from the reality and centrality of Asar Lanu Asar Russos, <laughs> what we're really being told is that Kiddushin as an institution, Ishus as an institution, reflects the fundamental um, perspective of Kiddush Yisrael. And Kiddush Yisrael is something that requires investment. When the goal, while the goal may be the equivalent of heter isha labala, a bond, you know, that reflects intimacy, you know, and baal ki ishto, ishto ki etc. Taking something which is physically neutral or problematic and turning it into, you know, an expression of, of kedusha, it's a very remarkable idea and a very halachic idea. While that may be the goal, you always have to invest in order to attain that goal. And the investment sometimes requires that you take a step back before you take a step forward. <laughs> that you um, make sure that the framework, that the environment right, in which this goal of intimacy or heter or simcha is going to be attained is one in which the people are protected is one which is formalized um, and in which there is no, you know, um, the room, you know, for, you know, misconstruing motivations, you know, for, for the, this being trivialized or, or perceived in a frivolous fashion, etc. The greater the Kedusha stakes, Kedoshim Tiyu, right? Kedoshim Tiyu requires Prisha. Um, it applies, requires that, to use the language of the Ramban, if you want to protect the transcendent goal of Ishus, a precious commodity, the foundation of Jewish family life, the core of Jewish life, then the first thing you have to do is formalize the relationships, protect the parties. And that is done through Ha'isha Nikneis. The Gimel Drachim, I'm not going to go into details now, highlight different dimensions, each of which can accomplish the goal, but there are different dimensions. Mid Kedushe Bia, Nishma Le Kedushe Kesef, but also in the other direction. Um, indeed, this is a Kenyan which actually transcends life itself, which is why Misa is considered a Kenyan in the opposite direction, a kind of a, of a Matir. And this Kenyan idea is the Chiddush of Matan Torah alongside Ede Kiyum. Having Ede Kiyum 
again, without going into details, is certainly the Ritva's view on Mem Gimel and Reb Chaim's view in Chosim and Mechalitza. The Eid Akim are there not only to ensure under all conditions, right, that, you know, we document such a transcendent change in moment, and that, again, can be no, you know, um, um, confusion about it, but it's there to lend kind of a, what I call solemnizing presence. It's there to um, catapult, you know, Isha. Isha isn't simply the physical action that you're witnessing. The presence of the witnesses formalizes it and solemnizes it, you know, in a way that goes beyond that. The two chidushim of Matan Torah, the Kinyan and the Ede Kiyom, more to, more to the point, splitting Arison from the Suin, calling it a Kinyan with everything that seems to imply, um, calling it Kiddushin, the Osar Akula Alma Kahekdish, highlighting the exclusiveness of this relationship, not as kind of a Bidi Evid, but as something that is a prerequisite, right, for the intimacy part, um, to turning that into a Kiddusha. The Osar Lanu Asarusos, even as an Osar, that exactly is the mitzvah. And that's why we say in the Ramam and the Koterit, in my opinion, right, Lisa Isha, Biksuva, Bikidusha. What the Ramam is saying is, the Ram says the goal of Isha isn't Kiddushin, right? The goal is Nisuin. It's to engender, right, an intimate, transcendent bond. But the methodology, halachically, of doing that is the mitzvah of Likuchin Elu Mitzvah Sase. That's exactly what the words mean in the Koteret. Lisa Isha, the goal is Lisa Isha. But to do it, Miksuva, I don't want to get into the Miksuva part right now, Miksuva Vikidushin. And Likuchin Elu Mitzvah Sase. The mitzvah is Dafka Likidushin because it's an Oser, but because by having an Oser as a precondition to the Matir, what you accentuate is that this is a long term, non frivolous relationship in which mutual respect and mutual rights are protected and guaranteed. And in such an environment, the Nisuin isn't just a heter bia, it becomes a davar shabikdusha. And therefore, ha'isha nikneis begimel drachim, and the osar kolama kehektesh, and the osar lanu esor rusos, all of this establishes mikadesh amo Yisrael ha'yidei chupa v'kidushin. I believe that's also, this will all conclude, why the Rambam began, you know, with, with history. Like, it's strange. Why does the Rambam begin Kodem Matan Torah, Adam Ayapogeisha, Bashish, you know, Bashuk, Ratzahu, Ratzdeh? They're obviously the same, the name of his father. <coughs> that, you know, um, that the, the Rambam was trying, maybe the Rambam was trying to address the Nusach, you know, uh, Bracha, you know, problem. Like, why do we say, why do we keep mentioning the Suin even before Ayrson and Birchas Ayrson? He said, because historically, before there was Matan Torah, there was Nisuin, you know, and Kodam Matan Torah. Okay, I always thought that was very interesting. Um, I think, you know, if that's all that it was, that's all that I heard the Rav say, and then it was Father, it would be a little bit Tamua. So like, okay, that's, uh, first of all, the Ram doesn't connect it to the Masach HaBracha, and B, okay, <laughs> why are we giving so much prominence to it? But I think the real idea is, so what the Ramam's telling us is as follows. The goal of Ishus um, has always been the same. And that is to engender a bond, you know, and where the physical intimacy part is a reflection and a symbol of the existential bond between husband and wife. But exemplifying the Chita Shemat and Torah, right? Nitna Torah and the Chidushim of Edekiyum and Kinyan and Erison, Kodem the Chidushim, Kodem the Nisuin, all of that highlights that these goals, which can so easily, you know, be misdirected, in the end of the day are enhanced by and they are guaranteed or secured 
by the methodology of Torah mitzvos, of Maimon Arsinai, of Matan Torah. And therefore, it's really Kuchenela Mitzvah precisely because it is a Kenyan and an Oser, and it's done in the presence of Edekiel, you know, and, um, um, and so on. So this is uh, just, you know, again, a, a conceptual way to look at, of course, this is a conceptual way also, you know, to look at Birchas Erison. Um, again, that bracha that many of the Rabbanim end up saying at a wedding, which is, as the Rush points out, extremely long, multi-themed, complex, strange. Like, why do we say Vitzivanu al Arayos Vasar Lanuus Arusos before we get to the, you know, Vihita Lanuus Andesuos? And even then, you know, it's tantalizing because that's not what we're doing right now anyway. If, if you know, in modern weddings, it's a five-minute wait. But, you know, in the olden days, it was much more than that. It was, you know, months and months. So, like, what is that all about? So the rush was motivated to conclude that um, this is really not a birchas ha-mitzvah. It's a birchas shabach v'hoda. Although, again, a lot of what he says about why it's a shabach v'hoda is... Um, you know, consistent with what I've just been trying to articulate, which is that Ishus, you know, itself, you know, the, the Isur of Arayos and the Isur of Arusos and so on, all these are things to praise because they highlight the stakes and the standards, you know, and, and ultimately the transcendent goal. Um, in the end of the day, um, says the Rush, but yeah, you're right, it's not a Bir Mitzvah. My view of the Rambam has always been and I, I see there's some of my tummy in the mirror who've heard these things from me in Kiddush and Inksuvah's days, is that, uh, on the contrary, you couldn't, according to the Rambam, there's no more accurate bracha than Birch HaSeyerson. And it's length and it's multifaceted, complex, um, you know, seemingly negative, you know, orientation or jumping the gun with the, all of this is exactly a description of what the mitzvah of Kiddushin as the Mishnah in the beginning of Kedushin and the first Gemara in Kedushin, you know, explained it are all about. What it's saying is, you know, if you want to understand, you know, what uh, is unique and what the goal here is, right, it's Vitzivanu al Arayos, V'asar lano asarusos. Means that when it comes to the area of Ishos, it's not that the Torah doesn't care and it just gives you a hetera and blanket to, you know, fulfill your passions or, or whatever, um, or sees it, you know, as not being in a, you know, uh, on the contrary, the standards are extremely high. You know, who you can choose and what conditions you can choose, you know, to express this uh, aspect of, of human existence is extremely limited. And the reason for that is because we have standards for it and we have goals and we want to ensure and secure the sanctity of it. So it's Vitsivanu, we're celebrating all our rayos, you know, because if there weren't standards, then this would just be an animalistic, you know, heter. Um, and it's even also Lanos Arusos, stepping back as a matter of, you know, first creating a proper foundation, you know, which is respectful and, um, and, and you know, paves the road, you know, for what ultimately be, will be the intimacy, but an intimacy, which is an expression of Kedusha, is, is the mitzvah. So it's also Lanos Arusos, Kedei, right, She, Behita Lanos Anasuos. And it's all your day, chupa, that's the goal. But it's chupa vekidush. And that's why it's mekadesh, amo Yisrael, ayide chupa vekidush. This is a symbol of kedusha Yisrael. If you want a great example of a microcosm of, of what Torah mitzvos, you know, what normative, you know, commitment is, what the Torah wants us to be, you know, doing, it's taking a little bit, you know, of a more complex posture, investing, securing um you know uh all the all the elements you know which will allow you know the impossible and that is the sanctification of uh, of physical life um and that that's what the torah is Kiddush in general that's what nitna torah you know basinai you know is really all about so the likuchin elu the kinyan the edikium are are a great um representation of Mekadesh HaMa Kupa Vekidush. So I just want to um, thank you. That's, uh, you know, I wish, I hope the rest of the um, convention is um, successful. And as I say, it's really a schuss for me to be 
um, speaking Lezecher Nishmas Rabbi Schoenfeld, who is really such a wonderful um, rabbinic leader and principled man and a you know, very talented man. And again, I enjoyed very, um, you know, as a son of a colleague more. And then later, he was very encouraging um, as well. But he was a, invited me off into his shul and our families are very, very close. And that alone would be um, a very big schos. And of course, again, I don't want to um, become too emotional, but uh, of course, um, you know, to say words of, give me the opportunity to say a few words um, about my father and then to, you know, associate with his tremendous legacy, um, you know, both his personal legacy and his legacy as a, you know, in the organization and as a Talmud of the Rav. Um, so I thank you very much. Thank you, Kulta. Thank you very much. We very, very much appreciate your time and your insights and, uh, and learning from you. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll look forward to seeing you at noontime tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Thank you.